the Roaring Twenties. I'm looking forward to today's video because we're going to be jumping around a lot of different subjects that happened in the 1920s, very much like Mrs. Dalloway's book, which you probably don't get until we start talking about Mrs. Dalloway's book towards the end. And uh, I'm very excited about this. So, because you know I like to jump back and forth and back and forth and you never know where the rabbit trail is going to go. Please note, wow, the 1920s, that's like, that's like a hundred years from today. Oh, that's kind of... I'm just thinking to myself, what if you're watching this video like 40 years, like right now I'm like 90 years old when you're watching this video. Oh, so this week, this week, um, today is February 3rd, 19, today is February 3rd, 2021. Um, this is the third week of, of President Biden's new administration. He signed his 47th executive order. At the end of this week, Tom Brady is the Buccaneers quarterback, is going to be playing in the Super Bowl against Patrick Mahomes, the chief quarterback. And uh, the most important thing this week is that yesterday, Punxsutawney Phil said that there was going to be six more weeks of winter. It just dawned on me that some of you are going to say, you know what I learned this week in your video, Dr. Jones, is that... Uh, the giant rodent, that groundhog up there in Pennsylvania, saw his shadow, and we're going to have six more weeks of winter. Don't write that down. You know who I'm talking to. Let's start with the Roaring Twenties with the Red Scare. Okay, yeah, the Red Scare. Uh, the Reds, the Communists, the bad guys. Well, from my point of view, because I grew up in the 80s, uh, the Red Scare, the Bolsheviks. Now, not only the Bolsheviks, we're also talking about the anarchists. So, starting right after World War I, and we talked about that in the last video, that the Bolsheviks, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, and they killed the Tsar, and now they're in charge, and they pulled out of World War I, and that's why we kind of went into World War I, and now they're, and they're now going to be the Soviet Union, well, in a couple of years, but they're going to be the Soviet Union. Great! Well, not from our point of view. Uh, we're going to see this as we're going to see this as a, a an attack on our democracy here in our little political cartoon. We've got this uh, Ivan Ivan looking guy with the torch and says anarchy. He's about to burn the flag. Yeah, it's not just the Bolsheviks, but it's the anarchists. In, in the nineteen in nineteen nineteen, we had a we had a rash of of mail bombs like mailbox bombs, not bombs made by males, but I guess they probably were mailbox, it doesn't matter. Um, 36 bombs sent, sent in the mail, and it was actually, <laughs> I looked this up, so dynamite, a small stick of dynamite in the in a package, right? And so then you put a, a, the mercury a blasting cap on top, and then you put a vial of acid on top of that, and then a spring on top of that. And so then when when the when the package gets there and they're like, uh, open from this end only, and then somebody opens the box, the spring springs, and then the acid breaks over the mercury, whatever, and then boom! Pretty clever, I suppose. So 36 male uh, bombs, and only two of them went off. One of them, unfortunately, uh, uh, blew off the hands of the housekeeper who was opening the box, um, and then another person also died. Uh, but it was, they were actually, uh, a lot of them did not meet their target because one of the guys, he opened the box from the wrong end. He opened it and was like, huh, why is there a piece of dynamite? Oh, this is a bomb. And so then he alerted the, the postal authorities and a whole bunch of them were found. Okay, but the anarchists, the anarchists. So we're scared about the anarchists and the Bolsheviks, the, the communists. Uh, criminal syndicalism laws made it illegal to advocate social change through violence. We really still have that idea going today. Ironically, here in the year 2020, during the summer, uh, uh, using using uh, advocate social change through violence, right? Well, you think back into the last summer. Uh, hmm. Seems like that's that's what that's talking about. Striking was considered un-American because if you were striking, you weren't working for America, which means you must be a communist or an anarchist, and so you shouldn't join a union, according to the 1919-1920s. Uh, and if we, if, we, if we have our poster boys uh, for this particular slide, we have Sacco and Vincetti. So Sacco and Vincetti, probably top, well, certainly definitely top 10 most famous 
uh, jury trials in the United States of America. I mean, O.J. and you know some other guys, but uh, oh yeah, but, uh, we'll get to them. But Sacco and Vincetti here, and so uh, they are Italians and they're anarchists because they follow the, the Italian anarchist Gallinari, and uh, they're they're going to be accused of stealing a shipment of uh, uh, some money uh, from a shoemaker shoe factory. And they're going to go up. They're going to. Uh, they're in, up in Massachusetts. Okay. So why is this important? It's important because uh, during the trial, and in fact, right before the trial started, the jury foreman made a, a big old speech about how he hated anarchists. You know, trial by jury, trial by non-biased jury. That <laughs> would you know. That's fine. Um, and so the trial basically went out there, and, and in in the in the trial they, they talked about how Sacco and Vincetti they were they were anarchists and they were anti-Americans and they were let's see do I have this uh, they were Italians and they were atheists and they were draft dodgers and um, the <clears throat> the trial went and then they the jury well the jury came back like in one hour and they said yeah you guys are guilty they both went to jail and. Um, they're going to be executed, and sure enough, in 1927, they are both uh, executed by electric chair. I was going to say something about that. Uh, no, uh, in electric chair. Now, interestingly enough, later after that, there's more and more evidence that has come out, and I, people are still actually talking about this case about what, were they the ones who really did it? And um, they're seeing all sorts of bias that came out of the judge and the prosecuting attorney, and for that matter, the defense attorney, and for that matter, the the jury members. And then really in, uh, in 1977, so 50, 50 years later after this trial, the governor of Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis, uh, made, a, made an executive order that basically said, yeah, we're not real for sure if they're guilty. So if they're not, we'd like to apologize. Of course, they've been dead for 50 years by the lecture chatter. But have I spent enough time on this slide? Let's move on. This was what's going to happen if communism and the Bolsheviks come to you. They're going to light the flag on fire. And here we have, fight the good fight. Kill it now, Bolshevism. And you have the strong American, and he's killing the evil Bolshevik state snake. Let's move on to the Klan, shall we? <laughs> From communist to the Klan. Well... KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. As last we left, the KKK uh, in the you know during the Civil War and right after the Civil War, and they're uh, obviously not happy with how the Civil War ended, and they're going to go around through the countryside in the South and they're going to do those awful things. Well, you know, ultimately, that group of ne'er do wells and criminals they are going to age out. They're going to eventually kind of. Their roles are going to drop, and they're going to fade out. The KKK fades out in the 19, and sorry, in the 1880s, 1890s. We really don't hear about the KKK very much at all. Then, the birth of a nation is a movie, uh, 1918 or 1919. It came out, and the birth of the nation. Oh, it's a that's a really uh, really important movie in American history. One, it was. Uh, the first movie that had an intermission because it was like three hours long. Two, it was the first movie that had an orchestra, an orchestra score, and so you could with the orchestra up front, and they could play while the movie's going because they didn't have, you know, they didn't have sound yet in the movies. And that's yeah, that's all great and that's wonderful. But why is it important? It's important because uh, right, it was the catalyst to start the second iteration of the KKK. And why is that? Because the movie is actually about uh, Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War, and they have a, they portray Abraham Lincoln in, in a really good light, but then they portray the white uh, slave owners also in a very good light. And in general, they portray the African Americans slash slaves in the, in the uh, movie. They treat them as, or the stereotype is that they are all uh, incredibly dumb and or sexual deviants. So, when this movie went out, went out uh, all over the United States. In fact, it was the very first movie to be screened inside the White House. President Wilson watched it. When this went out, it encouraged. I was going to point at Uncle Sam, but it, point, uh, it encouraged the KKK to restart. 
So the KKK is going to kick off uh, in the 1920s, and they're going to be pretty dang strong uh, for about a decade. And then the 30s, they're going to kind of drop off. In fact, the, the KKK says that uh, if you look, if you if you uh, Wikipedia Wikipedia them, and if it's on Wikipedia, it must be true. They claim that they had up to four and a half to five million men who had signed up to be members of the KKK in the 1920s, which was 15 percent of the population of the eligible male population. Because I looked it up, 1925, the U.S. population was 115 point. 115.8 million people, so doing the math right. A lot of people. Where do I want to go with this? Anti-foreign, anti-Catholic. Okay, so if KKK, in general, they are anti-foreign, anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, anti-pacifist, anti-communist, anti-black, anti-internationalist, anti-evolutionist, anti-bootlegger, anti-gambling, anti-adultery, and anti-birth control. What are they pro? Oh, I've got it up there, good. They're pro-Anglo-Saxon, pro-Native American. Oh, no, the word native is in quotation marks, and so we're not talking about Native Americans, we're talking about Native American, which means whites. Uh, and pro-Protestant, so uh, WASP. You, you, you can say that they were wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant wasp. Not all wasps, by the way, are members of the KKK. The Klan is going to take a hit in their popularity when it was discovered officials were embezzling money, and one of their leaders and one of uh, they broke into two two significant groups, and one of the leaders was accused of rape and crazy stuff. So uh, ultimately, the Klan is going to take a hit. Now this is. Uh, Obviously, race relations, this is kind of like the nadir uh, of race relations during this time period. And so we have things like the Tulsa race riots that you learned in Oklahoma history. Yes, Tulsa race riots, uh, 1921, where we had 35 blocks, 35 neighborhood blocks of uh, African-American homes destroyed. Um, even, I mean, there's, there's uh, anecdotes of private airplanes, you know, dropping gasoline bombs, and, and uh, this was uh, considered to be Black Wall Street, right? You learned all this in, in Tulsa, Tulsa race rights, yeah? The Black Wall Street, which is the most affluent black neighborhoods in the entire United States of America, which was in Tulsa in 1921, and then we had the race riots, and we had uh, different accounts, but up to probably 300 people killed. The worst race riots in U.S. history. Oh, Klan, right. By the 1930s, only, they only had 30,000 members, and then they faded away in the 1940s. So we're not going to hear about the Klan. Oh, until we get to the third iteration, which is the 1960s. That picture, actually, I think is from Tulsa. Tulsa, Oklahoma, right there. And you've got you know, the, the white robes that we that we uh, associate with the Klan didn't they they didn't exist really in the first iteration when we're talking about post Civil War, the white robes really came about in the second iteration, which were which were spurned on by the the portrayal of the Klan in the movie, The Birth of a Nation. New topic. Immigration. Ooh, a lot of people are coming to America. So Congress is going to go. You know what? I think we're going to we're going to really clamp down. We're going to have a quota system. So a quota system is, you only get this many people, or you have to have this many people, depending on which way you look at that. And so they're going to assign uh, the the quota number of three percent. So they're going to say in the in the year 1910, however many Italians there are in the United States. You take 3% of that number, say if there's a million Italians, you take 3% of that number and you get what? 3,000? 3, 3, you get 3,000, so 30,000. <laughs> you get 30,000 people, and that's as many people as you can bring in to, uh, you can bring in per year, which is great for the Italians, because there's a lot of Italians here, uh, and it's great for the Germans, and it's great for the British, and it's great for the... Oh, what about the Chinese? Oh, right, because the Chinese were, were still being excluded. Well, what about the Japanese? Well, they're going to be excluded. Hmm. Then, uh, just a couple years later, uh, it's going to be dropped in 1924. It's going to be dropped to 2%. And 
because still we have way too many people coming in from the point of view of the 1920s. And we have a very famous political cartoon. We have the Europeans all being funneled down to, these, to that little squeeze, that bottleneck, and Uncle Sam basically counting them. Um, please note, it does point out in 1924 the rules that says if you're from Canada, Canada, I was about to say Canada, Canada or Mexico, there's no quota. And here's why, because if you're from Canada or Mexico and you irritate us, we can just kick you out really easy. You know, if you're from Zimbabwe or from India or from uh, Myanmar, then, or East Timor, least Timor, um, it's harder for us to kick you out because, you know, we've got to put you on a, a boat or an airplane to get you back to Mexico or Canada. We just, right, kick you across the border, north or south. So that, that, was, that was the philosophy. All right. <laughs> New topic. I told you we were just going to bounce around topics. The Roaring Twenties. The prohibition. So the 18th Amendment passed in 1919. Well, it was, yeah, passed by the states in 1919. In fact, it says right there, 36th state ratifies the, the amendment on January 16th. U.S. is voted dry. So, you couldn't make it, you couldn't sell it, you couldn't transport it. And then, ultimately, they're, they're going to pass the Volstead Act. And the Volstead Act was basically the teeth of the 18th Amendment. The 18th Amendment says you can't, you can't sell it, make it, or transport it. The Volstead Act says if you sell it, transport it, or make it, then... Here are the punishments. And then the Volstead Act uh, includes other things like things that, you know, that's not obvious in the 18th Amendment. Because the 18th Amendment is really short. It says you can't, you can't have alcohol. Um, well, what if it's for medicinal purposes? Like, you know, whiskey is for medicinal purposes. The Volstead Act, <laughs> the Volstead Act, uh, talks about that and says, okay, well, if it's for medicinal purposes, it's it's okay in certain uh, ways. And then other ways that you can use alcohol for non-drinking or non-consumption. Now, are you sitting there thinking that through? How many, how many ways can you use? Oh, you can use it to clean stuff. Uh, you could use it to... Yeah, <laughs> right. So the Volstead Act was passed, and on, uh, let's see, January 16th. So on January 17th, uh, on January 17th, at midnight, the Volstead Act went into effect. And <laughs> research shows that at midnight it went into effect. At 12.59, 59 minutes later, we had the very first infraction of the Volstead Act, and that was a couple guys who robbed a train, $100,000 worth of, medicinal whiskey and it took him less than an hour to break the law why did why in the world would this pass why would it pass you can't have alcohol in the United States why how why would people vote for that right I mean I don't drink alcohol but why would people vote for that well the southern wasps white Anglo-Saxon Protestant the southern wasps were in support so as to keep alcohol out of the hands of the blacks and I know you're sitting here thinking but wouldn't it keep the alcohol out of the hands of the, of the wasps You'd think that, but we're going to see that nobody actually followed this rule. Westerners believed alcohol contributed to crime. You know, crazy people in the saloon. Oh, yeah, I remember uh, Gary Nation in the saloon. I think I have a picture. Absenteeism, absenteeism at work decreased and individuals' bank savings increased. Who'd have thought? The less people get drunk, the more they show up to work. The less people get drunk, the more money they have in their bank account. Interesting. However, oh, here we go. But, however, it was really never enforceable. Never really enforceable. Few, we didn't have very many enforcement officers. And blue laws, you know, blue laws are really tough to enforce. And of course, you guys know that a blue law is a law that's basically uh, a, a morality law. Like, in Oklahoma, we, have, we had several blue laws that basically said you can't buy alcohol on Sunday in a liquor store or liquor stores close at nine o'clock, or you can't have, uh, you can't have uh, anything, uh, 3.2 beer is the most alcoholic beer you can sell at a Walmart. Uh, now, we've since changed those blue laws, but blue laws regulate morality. And so if we're talking about abortion, if we're talking about cigarettes, if we're talking about uh, uh, prayer in schools, that kind of stuff. So 
Those are hard to enforce if the public doesn't agree with them. And this is clearly a blue law that says, uh, you know, we've looked at it and we think drinking is bad, so don't drink anymore. Speakeasies became popular. Before we get to those, uh, we've already seen this cartoon, yeah? We've already seen this, right? Ah, uh, yeah, right? I love this cartoon. Partly because it references, you know, my favorite book. But uh, let's see, it says... Open in the name of poor, suffering humanity. Oh, the humanity, and you get it right. You see it. You see the analogy. Uh, you've got the giant wooden Trojan horse and the walls and the people. And what does it say on the side? Because it's labeled medical beer. Well, if it's for medical reasons, it must be okay, right? Because, you know, fortunately, I mean, that was by, way back in the 1920s. In the, in the you know, 1919, I suppose. Fortunately, in 2019, we never had any arguments about using stuff that, you know, was bad for you and, and saying it was medical purposes and, you know, like marijuana or... Speakeasies. So a speakeasy is a place that basically you can get illegal alcohol. You can get alcohol illegally, whichever way you want to go with that, a speakeasy. So a speakeasy could be as small as like two chairs in the back room of some place, or it could be a, a giant club like the Cotton Club. So speakeasy, we get the term speakeasy, gosh, if you look up the etymology of the word speakeasy, there's about 6,000 different versions. Um, one comes from, from uh, Australia, and the, the, you know, the, the illegal alcohol trade in the Australian, hey, speakeasy, mate, I don't know, I'm not, don't, please don't make fun of my Australian accent, and then, but it doesn't matter, the point is, Speak softly, speak easy, speak softly. Don't let the cops, don't let the cops know that we're actually serving alcohol. Of course, the cops knew. Are you, I mean, the cops went in there and they had alcohol. Are you kidding me? The cops brought alcohol. In compliance, uh, irony, irony, right? In compliance with the 18th Amendment, no intoxicating liquors allowed on the premises as they're all, you know, drinking their alcohol. Okay. Anything else I want to say, say about speakeasies? There were some speakeasies that... Uh, <laughs> they were so slick that you could go to, you could go up to the wall and knock on the wall, and the little drawer would pop out, and you'd put your money in the in the drawer, and you'd say, uh, "I want a name of a random alcoholic beverage," and then the drawer would shut, and then the drawer would come back out, and then you could pick up your illegal alcohol, and you never saw the person behind the wall, and that's called a blind tiger. We also have blind pigs. See, I did have other things to say about speakeasies. Blind pigs. All right, you, you should write this one down. This is a fun one. A blind pig concept is where, okay, we can't sell alcohol to anybody. So here's what we're going to do. We've got this blind pig over here on the bar. And if you'd like to see the blind pig, uh, come on up here and we'll charge you $2 to see the blind pig. Maybe, you know, pat him on his head. And then... Just for playing the game of petting the blind pig for two dollars, we're going to give you an alcoholic drink. We're not going to sell it to you. We're going to sell you the ticket to pet the pig, but then you get the drink for free. Pretty slick. Pretty slick. Hypothetically, we had a situation you know, back when uh, Michelle Obama said, no, you can't sell chocolate inside school. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And then we're like, okay, well, how about this? Go to the restroom, get a whole bunch of paper towels, and then sell the sell one piece of one paper towel to your friend for a dollar because you're selling the paper towel. And then you give them give them the candy bar for free. Well, you're not technically selling candy. You're just giving away candy, but you're selling the... Ah, eh, you can't do that because that's still school property that you're selling. So I suppose if you brought like a box of Kleenex from your own home, you could probably do that. Hypothetically, of course. Al Capone. Chicago basically had two, well, they had lots of, but two major rival gangs, the North Side and the South Side. And Al Capone was put in charge, of the, or he was, he was a member of the South Side gang. His boss... Starts with a T. His boss, when it starts with an N, I don't know. His boss gets shot a couple of times, decides he's going to retire. And so when he retires, he gives 26 year old Al Capone, he gives him the reins of the South Side Empire. 
26 year old. And so when we talk, you know, you think about, oh, the great Al Capone, well, the, the evil, the crazy Al Capone. 26 years old. And so he's going to immediately <laughs> turn his empire into profit. So he's going to establish several brothels with, with the, the house of the prostitutes. He's going to establish lots and lots of uh, uh, illegal uh, speakeasies, and he's going to make hand over fist money. Um, he's going to run into some opposition from the north side, and ultimately, uh, we're going to talk about uh, one of the, you know, we're talking about the Boston Massacre, we're talking about the Sand Creek Massacre, here's the Valentine's Day Massacre, and so Valentine's Day, February 14th. Hey, that's next, is that next week? Three, this is the third, yeah, so it's pretty close. So, hey, next, next weekend, better have a plan. <laughs> Note to self, come up with a plan. Valentine's Day Massacre, and so he's going to find seven of his rival Northside gang members, and he's going to uh, have, uh, Al Capone's going to get some fake, fake cops, and he's going to have these fake cops arrest these guys and put them up against the wall and say, all right, you're, you're all under arrest, turn around, we're going to handcuff you, and while the guys are turning around under arrest and the fake cops bring in the guys with the, the Tommy guns and machine guns and kills all the people, and so here we have a pretty famous photo this photo is going to get out and it's going to be circulated amongst Chicago and really around the world and it's going to cause uh, Al Capone to become public enemy number one. You don't want to be on that list. Public enemy number one from the FBI's point of view and it's going to go downhill. He is going to, now obviously there's lots of crazy stories, kind of like we talked about Billy the Kid and you know uh, where he, <laughs> he gave the, the lady the money then he stole the money from the banker that took the money from the lady. Al Capone's going to have this kind of situation. He's going to own a flower shop, and gosh, you really just need to read about Al Capone. He's a fun guy. I mean, he's he's bad. He's a bad guy. He's a bad dude. But he, it's kind of fun to read. But his flower shop business, and he would, and he did, yeah, he did a lot of that Robin Hood kind of stuff. Ultimately, they're going to catch him and convict him of tax evasion because you know it turns out, and this is still the rule today, if you're involved in the illegal activity, for example, you're selling drugs. If you don't claim that on your taxes, then you can be you can be held uh, accountable. Federal law and state law, you can be held accountable uh, for tax evasion because you didn't record your illegal income. And I, I know you're sitting there thinking, but if I record my illegal e income, then they're going to know I'm doing something illegally. I know, but that's how they got Al Capone. So he's going to go to jail for, uh, he was sentenced for 13 or 14 years. He's going to serve 9, 10, 11 of those years. Uh, he's going to develop uh, neurosyphilis, and it's going to start making him go a little cuckoo, and then he's going to die a couple years after he gets out. So, do I have anything else I want to say about Al Capone? Gangsters ran the following vices, prostitution, gambling, narcotics, and kidnapping for ransom. The most famous one is the, is the Lindbergh baby. They never did get that baby back. I don't think they did. I have to look that up. But the Lindbergh baby, Charles Lindbergh and his wife... Not doing well. I'm not doing well with names right now. I'm gonna get it. No, his boss, Al Capone's name was the Lindbergh's baby. Just baby Lindbergh. I don't know. Okay, moving on. Congress passes law making interstate kidnapping a possible capital crime. When you see the word capital, that means death penalty. So, more of the story. If you kidnap somebody, don't cross the state line. Not a death penalty. It's a state penalty. Totally new topic. I told you we were going to do this. Totally new topic. So, Tennessee. I mean, oh, uh, yeah, it's at the very top. Tennessee is going to pass a law that says you cannot teach evolution in school. You can teach creation. God created the world in six days, rested on the seventh day. You cannot teach evolution in school. Charles Darwin. If you do teach evolution in school, you will be fined $100 for every teacher that talks about evolution in school. So, as soon as this law passed, uh, John Scopes, John? Huh? Yep, John Scopes, that's always a good guess. You say John in, in history, it works out. John Scopes is a substitute teacher. Actually, what happened was a group of people who wanted to fight this rule. And how do you fight the rule? Well, you get somebody convicted of it, and then you get your, your lawyers to argue that it's unconstitutional, right? So then uh, they went to a couple of science teachers, and the science teachers were like, no, I'm not going to say anything about evolution because it costs 100 bucks. And back in 1925, yes, 
back in 1925, 100 bucks was, whew, that was a lot of money. So they convinced the, the, the defense team, basically said, hey, I tell you what, why don't you take the day off, uh, science teacher? Well, I don't even know their name. <laughs> and they're important because they're the ones who took the day off. They took the day off and John Scopes, a substitute teacher, shows up and goes, all right, guys, today we're going to talk about the quadratic equation, and we're going to be talking about uh, plate tectonics, and we're going to be talking about the red scare. Oh, and we're going to be talking about evolution. Let me tell you about survival of the fittest. No, I'm sure he said survival is most adaptable, because that's actually more correct. And <laughs> it just so happens that uh, there are a whole bunch of newspaper people in the room when he said that. Um, it was like it was set up or anything, and you know, and the the sheriff was there too. It was kind of like it was set up. Anyway, so the sheriff's like, "Oh no, you said the word evolution, so you got to go arrest this guy, throws him in jail." Right? It was all set up. So we get the Scopes Monkey Trials so with John Scopes, and we say the Monkey Trial because the creationists. Uh, they're going to they're going to argue that evolution says that men come from monkeys, which is not what it says. Uh, and then, of course, then the flip side. So here, so this is going to be a big show. It's going to be such a big show that it's going to be become a national thing. And if you have a national trial, then you got to have big egos show up to be the lawyers. And so we have two of the biggest egos around. We've got William Jennings Bryan, the guy on the far left. Oh, William Jennings Bryan. This is where you say, I've heard of this guy. I've heard of this guy. Where have I heard William Jennings Bryan? Yeah, remember he ran for president like three, four times, lost every time. So he, he's going to run. He's running for president, uh, running for, no, he's the prosecuting attorney. So the prosecuting attorney that says, yes, the $100 should stand because you can't teach evolution. So he's a big creationist. He's also a part-time preacher and works out and basically has the Bible memorized. It works out for him. Clarence Darrow. Clarence right here. Clarence is a self-avowed atheist, and he is a really famous defense attorney. These two guys know each other pretty well, uh, but they know that they're going to be doing the trial. And it is quite the trial, quite the circus. Uh, <laughs> there's a movie called Inherit the Wind. Man, you really, I think you'd really enjoy watching that movie. It's a, I know it's in black and white, but um, it's a great movie. It talks all about the circus that goes on while this trial is going on. And uh, these two lawyers actually get into it. And what's really interesting, at one point, um, Darrow, he's cross-examining somebody, and William James Bryant uh, objects and says basically that the, that the, that the uh, witness doesn't know anything about the Bible. And Darrow's like, well, if only I knew somebody who, had a, who knew something about the Bible. And William James Bryant's like, I know something about the Bible. And Darrow's like, oh yeah, I'll cross-examine you. And, when James Bryan says, I'm not scared of that. And so he goes up in the witness stand. So one lawyer is cross-examining the other lawyer on the truth of the Bible. Okay. So the atheist starts going, all right, so you believe everything in this Bible is true? Like every word? And William James Bryan's like, yep, every single word, exactly how it happened. And, and Daryl's like, really, every single word? Let's flip to page three. Let's flip, let's flip to page 18 and just goes through the Bible. And when Jesus Christ is like, yes, I believe that that happened just like that. And I believe the sun stopped. Wait, the earth stopped. Uh, that, these, that the sun stopped in the, in the sky, like it says in Elijah. Where is that? Where is the sun? Daniel? No. Whatever book it says, <laughs> Ezekiel. It could, is Ezekiel. Are you shaking your head like that? Are you shaking your head? Anyway, where it says that the sun stopped in the middle. Oh, no, that was it. No. I'm not going to edit that out because it's important that you saw that I don't know. No, I'm gonna, I, I, I know it. I just can't bring it to my head right now. So but it was a very interesting trial. And ultimately, ultimately, uh, they're going to find for the prosecution in that the, the judge basically said, I'm not real for sure which way that I actually believe whether creationism or evolution is correct, but ultimately he broke the law. The law said you can't talk about evolution in class, and you did. So you broke the law, 100 bucks. The substitute teacher ended up not paying the 100 bucks. It was actually his lawyers that ended up paying because it was a big. Have I spent enough time on this trial? It was kind of fun. What could be on the next slide? Actually, I don't remember. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> Uh, 
Men, men wouldn't look at me when I was skinny. But since I gained 10 pounds this new easy way, I have dates I want. Because apparently, in the 1920s, if you were too skinny, not so much, not so much, you weren't going to get any dates too skinny. This new easy way I have, the, I gained 10 pounds this new easy way. Uh, I could probably guess what the new easy way was. It's eat, eat, <laughs> eating, all right, eating, isn't that, isn't that how you, you know, can you gain weight otherwise? You should work out, and just, easy way. Andrew Mellon, tax policies, and we'll get to him a little and more later. Brought prosperity in the mid-1920s. I think that's actually the last slide we'll get to in a little bit. Bruce Barton founded advertising. Oh, look, for only $3 down, and it's yours. Just 3 bucks, and then, you know, like per week for the next five weeks, 50 weeks. You get this cool little typewriter. So advertising. Well, and advertising for her, too, I guess. Sports, 1920s, sports ball. Oh, man. Baseball. Oh, ho, ho. Big, big deal. Are we at Babe Ruth yet? Well, was it the 1920s? Ty Cobb? I mean, we're talking about some big baseball players. Like, the people, like, you should know. Oh, I should know because I'm sitting here trying to think of them. Football, 1920s. Football, American football. Eh, not quite what we're thinking, what, how we're thinking about it, but yeah, kind of. And let's see, soccer? <laughs> no, soccer. No, I've heard of soccer at this point. But uh, there you go. Basketball. Basketball is getting big at this point. Buying on credit. Ooh. So this is going to become a you know a thing in the cities where people are going to go up to the to the department stores like Montgomery Ward and go oh I sure would like to do that if I but I only have ten dollars and the Montgomery Ward says well if you only have ten dollars today I'll take it but then you owe me extra uh, uh, interest if you want to buy the rest of it and uh, that'll get you in trouble if you can't afford it in cash think that all the way through think it all the way through. That is today's economic lesson. What's next? Henry Ford. Henry Ford gets a, you know, we, we talked about Ford, Ford Motor Company, and we, we talked about the Model T Ford for $590, the Model T Ford. I think that thing goes up to like 35 miles per hour. Woo! Um, Model T Ford, the assembly line. That's what you need to remember from uh, Henry Ford, the assembly line. So beforehand, people were like, okay, I gotta put this, I gotta put it on, on. I'm about to talk about cars, <laughs> like I know anything about cars. So uh, this guy, he gets all the parts and he puts the steering wheel in, into the A, into the B, and then he takes the left tire and he puts it there and he puts the engine block, I think that's like a thing, the engine block in the front, this is a Volkswagen, this is the back, but this is before the Volkswagen. And then he puts the, the top on and does it in the windows and the, the windshield wipers and then, then, great. And then you start on the next car. Man, that takes forever. So instead, what you do, you have an assembly line and one guy is in charge of windshield wipers. And that's all he does all day long, windshield wipers. So you, if, you, if you do windshield wipers all day long, you're pretty fast at doing windshield wipers after a while. And this guy, this other guy, he's in charge of the left tire. And so, man, you can really kick cars out that way pretty fast. Now you can do that with computers now, and you can do that with basically everything, assembly line. I wonder how we could do that with teaching, assembly line teaching. Well, kind of in a sense, I mean, it's not like I teach all day different sub, well, I, okay, I'm a different person, but it's not like, it's not like back in the 19, uh, back in the 1700s where it's like, okay, guys, uh, I'm going to teach English and math and science and history. Can you imagine having a history class in 1770? Well, nothing really happened today. <laughs> oh, like the Boston Massacre of 1770. Um, and then people were like, no, 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 you should specialize. So I tell you what, uh, Grizzle, you get math. And Sanders, you get English. And Jones, you get what's left. Uh, I guess you get history. Oh, history. <laughs> I guess that kind of is a assembly line. Hmm. Never really thought about it like that. By 1930, there were 20 million Model T Fords on the road, and Detroit is the capital of the world when it comes to automobiles. <sighs> pros and cons, pros and cons. Now that we have more automobiles out there on the roads, here's what happens. More automobiles, that means more people die by automobile. Especially as cars start getting closer to 45 miles per hour, 50 miles per hour, whoo, and they don't have seat belts yet. More, uh, less dependence on the railroads. Well, see, all these presidents who have hated the railroads, this is a good thing for them. So the railroads are going to lose money because people are getting in their cars. 
More independence for women. Women can, get, can grab the keys and then get in the car and they can go. More independence for women. More auto-related jobs. Well, yeah, right, because you've got people on the assembly line, then you've got people who are, you know, doing the, the gasolina, the petrol. Uh, the, suburb, uh, the suburbs are more accessible, so you didn't have to live in the city. You could live right, you know, in the suburbs because you could drive there and back. Speedy marketing of perishable foodstuffs. So not all of your bananas were rotten by the time you got them. They, some of them were still, you know, not rotten. And then outlying areas were no longer really outlying. Texaco, one of our first gasoline companies. Yeah, all right. Oh, so we're on the ground, now we're in the air. So, all right. Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, December 17th, 18, no, 1903. Orville and Wilbur Wright. So Orville and Wilbur, they were bicycle mechanics, basically in Ohio. Is that right, Ohio? Do I have it up there? No, so I'm gonna say Ohio like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, Indiana? No, uh, Iowa. Ohio. I would say Ohio. So bicycle mechanics, and uh, I mean they basically tinkerers, people who like, you know, like today we'd say, oh, you like Legos, you just put things together. That's kind of the, these guys. So they were working with bicycles, and the story says that they were they were interested in how you can control a bicycle and keep it steady by the wait. I got this. Angular momentum. <sighs> yes. The angular momentum on a bicycle with the wheels going this way, and then, of course, when you're doing this and you're leaning this way and that way, it keeps the bicycle up and upright and going. And they were like, you know, on our gliders, you jump off of, you know, like a hang glider, they, they did that kind of stuff, and they're like, you know, you got to deal with a lot of different a lot of different vectors when you're, when you're flying because you've got to do the, oh, okay, okay, okay. you got to deal with the roll. You have to deal with the pitch, and you have to deal with the yaw. Did you just learn a new word, yaw? Good for you. The roll, the pitch, and the yaw. Somebody tell Mr. Midget that I, I was teaching that, because he'd be impressed that I knew that. Ah, uh, would he be impressed? No, he'd probably just go back and do that. So they came up with a patent of how to uh, work with that on hang gliders. And then they were like, you know, we could use Bernoulli and we could build this little this little bad boy right there, the Wright Flyer number one. And they took it out to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, because, you know, it's right down the street from Ohio, and they got a small crowd together, and the very first flight of heavier than air aircraft, the very first flight, it lasted 12 seconds and went 120 feet. Does that seem like a lot? Does that seem like a lot? 120 feet? 120 feet, what, it's 30 yards. So 30 yards, that's 30 yards, like on a football field, 30 yards. So, uh, okay, band people, uh, if you're stepping eight to five, that's six and five. It's 48 steps, band steps, eight to five band steps. That doesn't seem like a lot, right? That's not that far. 30, 30 yards. That's like from my wall over here to Shattuck's wall on the far end. I mean, it may not even be that far. But it's not very far. But the point is, it was the first time anybody did it with a craft that was heavier than air. I mean, they've been doing, they've been doing hot air balloons since 1799 with the Montgolfier brothers. With, and with the sheep and the chicken and the... The sheep, the chicken, and the cow? The cow? No, the sheep, the chicken, and the... Duck, the sheep, the chicken, the rooster, the sheep, and the sheep, the chicken, and the donkey, the cow. Anyway, there's a sheep and a chicken and another animal that went on the first, very first hot air balloon. Now you have a lot of things to write down. Things I learned today. Groundhog. Something about speakeasies. Oh, blind pig. And now the sheep, the chicken. Somebody looked that up for me. The sheep, the chicken, and the something were the first animals in the first hot air balloon. Montgolfier Brothers, 1799. Bicycle business, 12 seconds, 120 feet. All right, so that's 1903. Uh, if we talk about uh, the war, 1914, assassination of Archduke Francis Ferdinand. We're getting to the war in 1917. United States getting to the war in 1917. We are going to have the very first airplanes in a war. And so we're talking about the biplanes. So I have a picture. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the biplane, the triplane, the triplane right there. The famous Red Baron, the famous Red Baron. Uh, 80 kills. He was the German, the German ace. If you kill more than five planes, you shoot down five planes, you become an ace. Uh, oh, and he was shot down himself by Arthur Brown. The LT, in 1927, Charles Lindbergh, and there he is, Charles Lindbergh. Oh, 
dad of the famous Lindbergh baby, which I'm not going to remember the Lindbergh baby's name, uh, flies solo across the pond, the Atlantic Ocean, in 33 and a half hours. 33 and a half hours. Got to stay awake. That's a lot of coffee. 30, ooh, where do you go to the restroom? 33 and a half hours. I'm here over the Atlantic Ocean. I open the door. Up. Do I have anything else to say about that? I don't think I do. Let's see what's on the next slide. Oh, look at Snoopy and the Red Baron. If you don't know this cartoon, well, obviously you know the cartoon, right? Snoopy and the Red Baron. Oh, we did that last year, right? On, on the stage. Right, it was, uh, right, it was fabulous. The, the, uh, the people that built the Snoopy doghouse, they were expert stagecraft people. It was, it was brilliant. And they made the moon back behind it. It was, very, it was a very, very talented group of people. Feel free to uh, Google or YouTube. The Royal Guardsmen in 1966 had the, had the song. Snoopy was a... Oh, I'm not going to sing it to you. Then, uh, new topic, the radio. Usually, Lomo, Mr. Marconi invents the radio way back, right in 1890. The wireless telegraph is going to evolve to the radio, and radio is going to become big, big in the United States of America. Because really, if you think about it, I mean, how do you communicate across this vast, vast country? Uh, radio. Radio works pretty well. And, you know, radio travels at light speed, yeah, yeah. The radio was a centripetal force. Centripetal force. It brought people together. Most famous in the 1920s, that they had, obviously, well, I was going to say, obviously they had music. Well, I don't know if that was very obvious or not. Uh, but they had, they had uh, staged, the staged uh, comedies and readings. And so here are three pretty famous ones. Amos and Andy's, uh, Amos and Andy, uh, was that 1927, 1928, 1929? It was really the first big hit when it came to radio dramas. And I say dramas, it's more like comedies. The short version is that <laughs> uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't fly today. Amos and Andy were, uh, the characters were the, uh, two African Americans from the South and they're going to move up to Chicago and they're going to get into a lot of funny exploits. This particular radio show is going to go for like 30 years. It's going to be on the radio for like 30 years. So your great grandparents, your great great grandparents may have listened. Well, maybe your great grandparents uh, may have heard. Well, no, that'd be great great grandparents uh, may have listened to the Amos and Andy show. Uh, again, African Amer two African American characters and their and their moon Chicago and they, they get into all sorts of crazy exploits. The, the issue here is that it's actually two uh, white guys uh, who are voicing the two African American characters, um, which would not fly in in 1921, uh, 2021. And the reason uh, uh, the reason they took the, that job was because they had done another radio show called The Grumps. I think it was called The Grumps. And the two guys that uh, voiced the characters were afraid that they were going to get stereotyped. And so they, were, they thought, well, what we'll do is we'll do a radio show that, uh, where we're going to mimic, or we're, we're going to mimic the African-American Southern accent. And it's going to be so over the top that people won't recognize it's actually us doing it. So I spent way too long talking about that. Little Orphan Annie. The sun will come out tomorrow. No, I'm not going to do it. If I don't get it on the first time, I'm going to do it. Uh, the sun will come out tomorrow. Little Orphan Annie. And I know you're thinking, oh, the movie? The movie went for like 20 years. No, no, no. There was a serial. It was a serial. Every week they had Little Orphan Annie. If you watch a Christmas story, they talk about Little Orphan Annie decoder ring, right? You'll shoot your eye out. And then the Lone Ranger. Yes. Hi ho, Silver, Tonto, and Kimasabi, and uh, Lone Ranger. That was before my time, although I know who it is. Hollywood. Or, if you look real closely, it says Hollywood Land. Hollywood Land. That was before it became Hollywood. Hollywood Land. Motion pictures. 19, uh, 1890s, Thomas Edison, you know, we, we figured out the, the kinescope and the, 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 the little cars and it caused the little horse to run. 
Um, and then ultimately we figured out how motion picture work. And so the very first motion picture called 1903, the first uh, Hollywood motion picture, 1903, The Great Train Robbery. Uh, I have shown that in, I've shown that in class. Well, I hope I don't break copyright because you know 1903. Uh, the Great Train Robbery uh, is what, 12 minutes or so. And it's all, there's, there's no, there's no uh, sound because this is before they figured out sound, how to get it on there. And, <laughs> uh, well, I'm never going to get those 12 minutes back for my life after watching, I think I've watched it several times now, but, oof. I mean, they did, they did what they could do with those cameras back then, and, you know, the actors who were like, oh, I'm dead, and the next scene, they've already, they've moved over here, and they start breathing, you're like, no, you're dead, you can't, and then the guy gets, the guy's wrestling with the other guy on the, on the train, and then he gets thrown off the train, but it's quite obvious that it's a dummy, I mean, like, it's quite obvious that it's a dummy, but, yeah, they do what they do, I mean, they can't be all great thespians and, and script writers and stage actors, you know, like other people. Well, not yet. In the 1920s, we had some really great movies that came out, including The Jazz Singer, Ben-Hur, The Ten Commandments, Robin Hood, Oliver Twist, The, the Three Musketeers. You know there's actually four musketeers in The Three Musketeers? Did you know that? There's four musketeers. Ooh, you're some of you are to write that down, too. There's four musketeers in the book, The Three Musketeers. Athos, Aramos, Porthos, D'Artagnan. You didn't think I knew that. The Mark of Zorro, Nosferatu. Today we say Dracula. And the Phantom of the Opera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All those are books. Well, I don't know the jazz singer. Is the jazz singer a book? The Ten Commandments, well, that's part of the book. I think all the others are famous books. Steamboat Willie, in the bottom, uh, the bottom left corner. You're like, oh no, that's that's the that's Mickey Mouse from Disney, whatever, however he whistles. Originally, he was called Steamboat Willie. Look at that. And 1928, Hollywood Hollywood movies are used extensively in World War One as anti-German propaganda. Oh, surely not. Sure, thank goodness. 1921, we don't use movies as propaganda anymore. <laughs> The spread of motion picture culture led to increased assimilation of immigrants. All right, right? Centripetal. If everybody's watching the same movie, we can all talk about the same movie. So like in 1977, when Star Wars came out, like if you didn't watch Star Wars in the first month, then you were like, what is everybody talking about? This this crazy space movie with the pew, 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 and the guys, the stormtroopers who couldn't hit any of you know, broadside of a barn, and then the hero, and then the, you know. And then when you saw it, you're like, oh. Yeah, okay, I totally understand who Luke Skywalker is now. Same thing happened with Jurassic Park, same thing happened with the Titanic, same thing happened with Avatar, same thing happened with... I can't name any movies right now because I haven't been to a movie theater in, like, forever. But the, the immigrants couldn't talk with, you know, people who... I mean, if everybody is watching the same stuff, then we're all, we're all acculturated. Just some random facts. Margaret Sanger is going to push for birth control. Here she has a quote. She says, look, no one can call herself free who does not own and control her body. No woman can call herself free until she can choose consciously whether or not she will be a mother. Okay. Religious modernists said God was a good guy and the universe was a friendly place. So you're sitting here thinking, was God not a good guy? Ah, well, the last time we actually talked about the philosophy of God in American history, we were like, oh, uh, uh, Second Great Awakening, God's coming to get you if you don't, you know, convert to Christianity. And so, right, right. And so now we're changing that up, and now we're saying, ah, you know what, he's actually kind of a nice guy. You probably should get to know God. We have flappers, a uh, picture of a flapper here. Uh, uh, short skirts, drinking, driving, smoking. She's in her flapper's dress. Uh, she is doing. Can you name that? Can you name that dance? Can you name the dance? The Charleston. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nope, that's too many. Let's do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two. You can't really see my foot, my feet, can you? And then, so not only are you going one, two, three, four. Five, Five, six, seven, eight, and then you're doing like, you're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you're also kicking one, two, three, four, five, six, and while you're moving, 
I'm kind of out of breath now. <laughs> um, we have uh, dancers in class that I'll be calling, calling on you during Zoom time to show us the Charleston. So be ready. Jazz, 1920s, the jazz is, is, is coming. Then we have Sigmund Freud. Here's Sigmund. And Sigmund's going to have his five stages of psychosexual philosophy. He's going to have the Oedipus complex. Remember, kill your dad, marry your mother, Oedipus. We're going, uh, he comes up with the id, the ego, the super ego concept. So the id is, the id is your, like your inner demon that says, mm, cheeseburger, now. And the ego is like, hmm. Rationally, I need to go get some money to go to the store to get, or to McDonald's to get the cheeseburger. That's your ego. And the super ego is like, why would God create cheeseburgers to torment me? That's, so that's the three, the id, the ego, and the super ego. Did anybody write down cheeseburgers? Okay. Marcus Garvey is going, to, is going to found the United Negro Improvement Association to promote resettlement to Africa. Because it worked so well the first time, right? Do you remember what, what country is that? Liberia? Oh, you who said Liberia in the back? Good for you. Cultural liberation. After World War I, a bumper crop of riders of riders. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby. Have you read it yet? It starts off with, In my younger and more, more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, to, he told me, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you have had. And then it gets crazy. The Great Gatsby. Ernest Hemingway is going to write The Sun Also Rises, and for him, the bell tolls, and all sorts of crazy stuff. The Lost Generation. I think that's on the next slideshow. We'll get there. Uh, Sinclair Lewis writes Babbitt. James Joyce writes, <laughs> writes Ulysses. Yeah, check out Ulysses if you want to spend a lot of, of time reading a book. Uh, Mrs. Dalloway. I, think I, missed, I mentioned Mrs. Dalloway at the beginning, right? Mrs. Dalloway's book starts with... Mrs. Dalloway said that she would buy the flowers herself. Mrs. Dalloway said that she would buy the flowers herself. That's how the book starts. Now, if you... <laughs> ironically, we're about to do it. If you enjoy watching presenters that have no idea when they start a sentence and they have no idea where the sentence is going to end because at some point they might be talking about, I don't know, like the Trinity bomb, the nuclear bomb, or rabbits, or speaking of the bomb, you've got Richard Feynman who worked on the math behind the bomb and he played the bongos and broke into safes and one of the safest places to be is, if you enjoy listening to speakers like that or watching speakers like that or reading books like that, we call that stream of consciousness thinking. So stream of consciousness is like like you're in a dream, and you're like, la, 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 and you go way over here, and then you go right, right. So it's stream of, or, or just really listening to me. Um, Mrs. Dalloway is the book for you, because again, it starts off with, Mrs. Dalloway said to herself that she was going to buy the flowers, or she's going to buy the flowers herself. And then there's a red balloon. And, <laughs> and the whole book, you're like, each sentence, you're like, whoa, whoa, how did we go from, and basically she's just thinking out loud. I kind of like it because, you know, if you have a little bit of ADHD, <laughs> yeah, that's the book for you. And then Hugh Lofting, Dr. Doolittle. He's the one, right? Dr. Doolittle? You, yeah, I was going to say, have you read the book? No. You, did you see the movie? It's the most recent movie. Eddie Murphy, Dr. Doolittle. Or, or Brendan Fraser, was he Dr. Uh, Jerry Lewis, way back in the 50s, 60s, whenever he did his. Doctor, the doctor who could talk to animals. The Harlem Renaissance. Okay, so the Harlem, uh, the Harlem is a neighborhood in New York City and predominantly uh, African American. And so the Harlem Renaissance, we're going to have African American writers like uh, 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 um, the one who wrote The Invisible Man. Not H.G. Wells who wrote The Invisible Man, like The Invisible Man, but uh, Ralph Ellison. 
pulled that one out. Ralph Ellison, who wrote The Invisible Man, talking about how a black person was invisible in society. Well, it's a really good book. You need to read that one. Put that on your list, The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. Also, The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. That's a good one, too, but that's like, you know, the, the scary one. Uh, where was I going with that? Or Ella Fitzgerald, the, you know, the, the singer who, who does all the, the bebop, scat, scoodly do stuff. And then, uh, you know, pick Count Basie and Sashmo here. Uh, arms, uh, uh, the trumpet player. <laughs> Armstrong and, uh, and all of his crazy stuff that he does. Duke Ellington. Did I say that? The Harlem Renaissance. Last slide. Second to last slide. But the last the next slide's nothing. Okay. Taxes, nineteen twenties. The taxes. Andrew Mellon. Yeah. Andrew Mellon in the uh, in the nineteen twenties, he's gonna become the new uh, Secretary of Treasury, and he's gonna say, you know, the progressives uh, they they pushed for progressive taxes, which remember the progressive taxes, the more you make, the more of a percentage you're going to pay in taxes. So taxing the richer more than taxing the poor the poor people. Andrew Mellon's going to take that and he's going to go, no, that's not really working. What we need to do is we need to actually remove taxes from rich people. All right, follow me here. If you take taxes away from the rich people, have them pay actually less tax then what will they do with that? They're going to take, this is Andrew Mellon talking, they're going to take that money, they're going to invest in their companies. If they invest in the companies, what does that do? That creates jobs, jobs for poor people. So take taxes away from the rich, the poor people will eventually become better off because the money will trickle down from the rich people to the poor people. It's called trickle-down economics. This is the first time we're really talking about this. We're going to be talking about this quite a bit when we get to Ronald Reagan and beyond. Excuse me, but uh, this is where we first get it. Uh, give tax breaks to the large corporations so that money can trickle down to the general public in the form of extra jobs. So this is a, uh, in the year 2021, this is a Republican idea. Uh, the Democrats say, no, 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 tax the rich because they can afford to be taxed. Uh, in fact, just what yesterday, one of the... Uh, predominant uh, Democrats, Elizabeth Warren said, you know, we, we need to uh, tax everybody who makes 50, everybody who has more than $50 million in their bank account, $50 million in their bank account, all the way up to the people who have $1 billion in their bank account, we're going to tax them extra than what we're currently doing. And then that will basically solve all the problems of the world because, I mean, the, the rich people won't be very happy about that, but... Uh, Democrats, Republicans, Democrats, Republicans. Oh, but you know what? Here we go. In the 1920s, it kind of worked. In the 1920s, it kind of worked. Uh, Andrew Mellon's policies reduced the national debt by $10 billion in the 1920s, which reduced the national debt. I know today $10 billion is like, oh, that's so cute, $10 billion. That's so cute. I mean, wow. Oh, $10 billion. Good times. <laughs> when now we're talking about 10 trillion, you know, whatever, or what, I mean, what are we up to now? What, 35 trillion dollars in debt? Trillion dollars. Um, 10 billion, uh, we saved 10 billion dollars. Good for him. And this looks like it's going to go gangbusters and everything's going to be wonderful and everything's going to be great. And then we get to the last slide when we're going to jump into next week and we're going to get into the very late 1920s and early 1930s. Uh, we call it the Great Depression. Very, very, very famous photo. Very famous photo. Very famous photo. And there's this guy. $100 will buy this car. Must have cash. Lost it all in the stock market. Yeah. We'll talk about it next week. Okay, guys. What did you learn this past week in this video? I'll be curious to see what you write down. Yes, you're really going to do the Charleston dance on Zoom. Be good.